Joni Mitchell's music had a big impact on me growing up. I appreciate our choir bringing one of her songs to us this morning. Both Sides now captures the wistful, nuanced layers of growing up, the disillusionment and reimagining that can happen with adolescence and adulthood. In the song, she opens with the early romantic imaginings about life and love, and then she unpacks the jarring realities often discovered about pain and loss, the disillusionment. The sadness of it all can lead a person to become jaded. But then, with a twist, she reflects back on it all and chooses the romantic options anyway, saying that she really doesn't know life or love at all. Joni's strength as a songwriter is not limited to her lyrics, but her lyrics are a key component to her work. She lays such beauty out before us, showing the highs and lows of living with such poignancy. Many of your, her songs have this layer of poignancy, a sorrowful yearning. In our reading this morning from her book, Bittersweet, Susan Cain uh, talks about how creativity is often linked with a certain sadness or melancholy. The piece we heard from the book begins with the question, is creativity associated with sorrow and longing? through some mysterious force. At other points in the chapter, Cain writes about Beethoven and what he went through with writing, composing his Ninth symph Symphony, and in particular, the section we know as the Ode to Joy, a piece of work so exultant and yet laced with sorrow. The author also wrote about the life of Leonard Cohen, the artist most associated with the song Hallelujah, and whose life is certainly an example of a broken hallelujah. Is the melancholy suffering a requirement for this level of phenomenal creativity? Cain in the book is quick to assure readers on this point. It's not so much the suffering that is required so much as the bittersweet disposition. We shouldn't make the mistake of viewing darkness as the sole or even primary catalyst to creativity, she writes early in the book. After all, plenty of creatives are sanguine types, and studies also show that flashes of insight are more likely to happen when you're in a good mood. We also know that clinical depression, which we might think of as an emotional black hole obliterating all light, kills creativity. As Columbia University psychiatry professor Philip Muskin told The Atlantic magazine, creative people are not creative when they're depressed. So the image of creative people as tortured souls simply is not accurate. It's not what the book Bittersweet is about. I think it's more accurate to say that creativity is less about sorrow and suffering and more closely linked to yearning, tinged with that sorrow and sadness. The sadness seems to be a necessary component, but not sufficient on its own. Susan Cain, after all, did not title her book Bitter. <laughs> In her book, Cain is exploring the concept of the bittersweet. It's an experience and a perspective. And this is not just about creative artists, it's about all people, all of us, experience grief and sorrow, loss and pain, as well as joy and celebration, happiness. The experience of the bittersweet is an acknowledgement of that sorrow and pain, which so often is put to the side or ignored. The goal is not to be sad. The goal is to take life whole, to allow sorrow its full share, not the whole share, but a full share. In the Jewish book of wisdom, Kohelet, also known as Ecclesiastes, we hear that our lives are filled with beginnings and endings, with gathering and casting away, with breaking down and building up, with dancing and with mourning, a time for every purpose under heaven. Kohelet, like Susan Cain in her book, uh, calls us to take life whole to not refuse portions because they are hard 
or we label them as negative. As Unitarian Universalists, we have this practice of sharing joys and sorrows most Sundays. It's a common enough ritual among us that it's recognizable even if you uh, have been to other UU congregations. We invite you to share the ups and downs of your living, to recognize these happy and sad experiences as important and worthy of sharing in our worship together. One piece of the ritual I honor is that we don't parse out the joys and the sorrows. They're all mixed up together. It can be jarring to hear about a death or a grief and then swiftly move on to somebody's birthday or recovery. And occasionally someone will offer something that feels like both a joy and a sorrow. It's best not to draw too fine a distinction. It's best to allow all of these joys and sorrows to sit beside each other, jostling for attention and care because that's how life really is. My point, Susan Cain's point, Joni Mitchell's point, the point of the author of Kohelet, of Ecclesiastes, is this, sorrow should not be sequestered away as if something shameful. It's part of our living and indeed may open us up in some ways that are remarkable. In our sorrow, we reveal our compassion. I am, this morning, not offering an ode to sorrow. Instead, I'm saying our sorrow is a signal that we care. Consider, we have days of light and days of clouds. We live in the shadow of our losses and the bright light of new love. We have both light and shadow. And that's the way of nature and all of life. It's the light that we want, the joy that we want to share with others. But sorrow and shadow are present as well. If we only see the clouds and shadows as negative, we're missing an important part of what's happening. Think of the moment, a, a time when you've seen sunlight, like a, an actual ray of sunshine. Perhaps it was in a photograph, or maybe it's an experience you had while out in nature. Can you recall seeing sunlight uh, as it like shines through a cloud bank or a break in the trees, or maybe it's coming through the window in the morning across the dust of your room, and you actually see a ray of light. Have you seen that? As if it's got a definite shape. You could measure its length and width. The sunbeam in such an experience is clear because it is partly blocked by trees or clouds or the window. Unfiltered light shines everywhere all the time. We notice it. We see it. It's there. But when it's flickering, we really notice. When it's filtered through shadow, that's when we see it a little obstructed. I've looked at clouds from both sides now. They're both the feathered canyons and that which blocks the sun, and really both are worth it. Here's the real secret. With Joni's song, we're invited to see both sides of life, the love, uh, the clouds, all of those things, both sides. And we're invited to feel the joy and the sorrow, to, to the give and the take, the win and the lose. And the secret is the way that it's presented as two options. And yet the song calls us into a third option, which is both. Not one or the other, but both. A few years ago, I bumped into and took great solace in a blog post by Richard Rohr. He also talks a little bit about this. Richard Rohr is a process theologian I find to be very accessible. He was writing about order and disorder, using a metaphor of three boxes. We begin our theologian claims with order. We call it normal. This is his first box. We then experience a disruption, a time of disorder, something that upsets the way we want things to be, clouds. This is the second box. He continues saying that if we keep at it, we can find our way into reorder. This is not returning to how things were before. It's instead a reordering toward the future, given what has happened. Richard Rohr wrote, whenever we are led out of normalcy into sacred open space, 
It's going to feel like suffering because it is a letting go of what we used to be. So we often call that second box negative. He's calling it sacred open space. Essentially, he's advocating for the value of disorder. We could have, uh, he could easily have written about imperfection or suffering or grief. He picked a more neutral concept, disorder. That second box in his metaphor, disorder. You could equally think of it as the progression from thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, or as uh, sunlight, clouds, and sunbeams that arise from the interplay of light and shadow. This is not meant as a moral judgment either about light versus dark or joy versus sorrow. Instead, it's an acknowledgement of comfort and discomfort and the values of each. This is always painful on some level. Roar writes about in that blog describing the move from the first box order into the second box disorder. But part of us has to die if we're ever going to grow larger, he says. And he reminds folks of John's gospel, Jesus saying, very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Joni Mitchell's song, describes her childlike romantic imaginings about life and love. And they fall to the ground and they die. She reveals the jarring disillusionment and the hurt, the sadness of it all that can lead a person to become jaded. That's Rohr's second box, the disorder. Joni Mitchell's song then suggests not simply return to the first perspective, but an appreciation of that original romantic view through the lens of the lived heartbreak and sorrow. The goal is never to remain in the grief or the jaded heartbreak. It's a box to move through. The goal is to take life whole, to live all of it. Here's a piece of, from Adrienne Marie Brown, activist, writer, she says this, put your attention on suffering, which is constant and everywhere, and it is all you will see. Joy will come and laughter, but you will find it brief, possibly a distraction. Put your attention on joy, being connected and feeling whole, and you will find it everywhere. Your heart will still break. You will know grief but you will find it a reasonable cost for the random abundance of miracles, the soft, wild rhythms of love. Adrienne Marie Brown is sharing here the same message I take from Joni Mitchell's song. You can look at both sides now, from suffering and joy, and still somehow it's the joy we will recall. Now in the song, Joni calls them illusions. Her early romantic version of clouds and love and life, according to her, were illusions. This is the one big point on which I would argue with the amazing Joni Mitchell. <laughs> yes, clouds are not really feathered canyons. Seeing them as angels' hair is indeed a playful illusion. I will concede her description of clouds, yes, those are illusions. But to say the dizzy dancing way we feel when we fall in love is an illusion is simply not true. It's certainly not all there is to being in love, but that exciting falling in love time is not an illusion. And I would argue her counterpart in that verse, you, if you care, don't let them know, don't give yourself away, that is not to be commended as a better way to show love. That is more about protecting your broken heart than it is about being disillusioned with love. Certainly your heart can be broken if you give it away. That's part of what Joni is saying, and that part is true. But that's what it is to love. That's not naive or delusional. That's just the risk we take when we love. 
And so it is with life, too. Life is not meant to be something safe. It's meant to be a risk of love and faith. It's not something to be done shielded and in fear. The better way, living openly with all the tears and fears and feeling proud, that's not an illusion. That is, as I say, the better way. And when Joni ends each chorus, saying that she recalls the, that open and vulnerable way best, that is what Adrian Marie Brown is saying too. That's the reorder that Richard Rohr is calling for in the third box. Approaching from the side of joy, Adrian Marie Brown says, but be open and vulnerable to both the joy and the sorrow in life, and all will be well. It's bittersweet. That's how life is. Consider the interplay of light and shadow, the dynamic interchange of joy and sorrow, the wild poignancy of your loving. Be not locked into what has always been. It is not safety, we find, in being well shielded from sorrow and loss, but stagnation and death. Release your fears. Trust that the risk of sorrow and sadness is worth it more often than not. And in so doing, our lives will be both a little bit bitter and a little more sweet. And what's more, they will be whole. That is the goal. Let us have faith that such a life will lead us deeper into the fullness of living. In a world without end, may it be so. Please join.